Date, 1960. Target, Fidel Castro, Prime Minister of Cuba. Location, Havana, Cuba. Objective, kill on sight. Origins of this order, straight from John F. Kennedy himself. Fidel Castro was supposed to be an easy target. He ruled an underdeveloped island, didn't have a military anywhere close to the likes of the US, and he was in public a lot. A well-placed sniper, a bomb hidden from his security team, or even a drop of poison in his favorite wine. That is all it would take for an assassin to get the job done. It couldn't be simpler. So in 1960, the orders were given. A Cuban was paid $10,000 to shoot him on sights. It was supposed to be a straightforward job, except the guy never got the chance. Fidel Castro had gotten lucky. The next kill order was given soon after. See, during this time, the American Mafia was at its height, and they had expanded their operations like crazy. One sector they expanded into were casinos in Cuba. Not only are casinos a cash cow, but they are the perfect vehicle to launder money. The only problem was, after Castro took power, he seized the Mafia's casinos in Cuba, and the Mafia was furious. So not only did the Mafia and the CIA have a common enemy, but the Mafia had the manpower and expertise to pull off an assassination while allowing the CIA to keep their hands clean. So the CIA went to the American Mafia for help. And no, this is not a movie plot. This actually happened. The CIA actually wanted the Mafia to assassinate a world leader. So they went to Sam Giancana and Santo Traficante, two of the FBI's 10 most wanted, and offered them $150,000 to get the job done. The mob went with the poisoning route, trying to pour cyanide into a chocolate milkshake Castro ordered at a restaurant. Unfortunately, the waiter who had to do it got the packet of poison stuck in the refrigerator door, ripped it, and then spilled it all over the floor. He panicked and abandoned the job. Castro survived yet again. After the mafia, the CIA got desperate, and so did their assassination plots. In 1961, they tried poisoning his cigars. Two billions of a gram of botulinum toxin would be enough to kill him as soon as he put the cigar in his mouth. They even got as far as tasking someone to swap out his cigars for the poison ones. But again, Castro's security was too tight, and the plan failed. And this is where things got really weird. The ideas being thrown around were wild. Fidel Castro loved scuba diving and swimming, so they planned on filling his diving suits with tuberculosis bacteria that would make him sick and eventually kill him. They just couldn't figure out how to get Castro to wear the death suits, so they went back to the drawing board. They thought about filling the seashells near where Castro liked swimming with explosives, and for obvious reasons, that plan was abandoned. They designed a pen fitted with a hypodermic needle and poison vial. The pen was handed over to a friendly Cuban official who was supposed to inject Castro the next time he saw him. Instead, the guy got so worried he would accidentally stab himself that he threw the pen away and stopped answering the CIA's calls. This debauchery continued for four decades. According to Fidel Castro's Secret Service chief, the CIA and other groups made 634 attempts on Castro's life, every single time he escaped. Was it luck? Or was the CIA just grossly incompetent? Based on how badly the US government wanted him dead, it's pretty safe to say that he was one of the most hated but luckiest men in the world. But why? What had he done to jump to the top of the CIA's hit list? This is the story of the world's luckiest dictator. Fidel Castro was born in Cuba to a rich plantation-owning father. His mom was a farm worker, and Fidel was born out of wedlock. In school, Fidel was everything but an academic genius. He loved sports, especially baseball, and spent more time focused on that than schoolwork. In 1945, he started studying law at the University of Havana, and that's where he developed his revolutionary flair. Over the years, he spoke out a lot about corrupt governments and their presidents, but he was young and not seen as much of a threat. So in 1950, he graduated and opened a law office to help less fortunate Cubans get the legal representation they needed. Needless to say, the practice was a financial disaster. At the time, the Cuban government was extremely corrupt, all the way up to the presidents. Cubans were struggling to get access to medical care and education, and Fidel felt like it was his duty to try to make things better. So two years later, at just 26 years old, he ran for election to the Cuban House of Representatives. Up until then, he was trying to make a change the legal way, by following the rules. But then, right before the election, a military officer named Fulgencio Batista orchestrated a coup that kicked the sitting president out of power and gave him control of the country. 
Fidel had tried changing Cuba the right way. He tried following the rules, but his chance had been stolen by force by some American-loving dictator, and that just wasn't acceptable. It was time to fight fire with fire. When Batista took power, Fidel Castro got really mad. Here was someone that had no regard for the law or the Cuban people taking over their country and taking whatever he wanted for himself. In 1954, two years after becoming the leader of Cuba, Batista even held a presidential election as a way to taunt the people who didn't support his rule. He won because he had no political opponents. The entire election was a way to remind his servants who was really in charge. It seemed like Batista had complete control of Cuba, but he had overlooked one thing, the power of the masses. One year before the election, Fidel Castro and 120 men had tried to take over the army barracks in Santiago, Cuba. Their plan had failed and they were all sent to jail. This fixed election had given Batista a massive confidence boost and he felt really safe in his position. So just two years after being sent to jail, he released Castro as a sign of good faith to the US and to the Cuban people. He had been cooperating with America since the start of his reign, but obviously the US didn't want it to seem like they were working with a ruthless dictator. So they asked him to release the prisoners and to present himself as a little less dictatory. Batista thought that by letting the men go, he would earn their gratitude, but Castro just couldn't drop his grudge. As soon as he was released, he fled to Mexico, where he met the world's most famous revolutionary, Che Guevara. Together with his brother Raul Castro, Fidel and Guevara planned how to overthrow Batista's reign. In 1956, the three revolutionaries and 79 other people sailed from Mexico to Cuba. As soon as they arrived, they were ambushed by the government forces. Only 19 people survived, including Fidel, his brother, and Guevara. They fled into the mountains, and from there, they started building their army. Like I mentioned earlier, Batista had underestimated the power of the masses, and this would eventually mean the end to his rule. In 1958, hundreds of guerrilla fighters attacked. They ripped control of Cuba out of Batista's hands, and on January 8, 1959, Fidel Castro arrived back in Havana but not as a lawyer or a wanted fugitive of the state, but as the leader of the state himself. And he was ready to lead the people. Fidel Castro became the prime minister of Cuba. His years of fighting for equality had brought him to the highest point of Cuban government, and he wasn't going to waste any time leveling the playing field. Castro immediately started reforming the government to fit his socialist ideas. He took land from the rich, including his own mother, and redistributed it to the poor. He seized control of Cuba's casinos and their millions, many of which were owned by the American mafia, and used that money to fund social programs like opening schools and clinics. He improved Cuba's infrastructure, built hundreds of miles of road, and brought electricity to the countryside. This was at the height of America's war against communism, when wherever in the world communist ideas took hold, America met it with force and this time it was in their own backyard, a whole 10-hour boat ride from Florida. Castro wasn't going directly after the US, and a lot of what he was doing for Cuba at the start was arguably good, but then inevitably, the money ran out. Spending millions on fixing the country without encouraging free enterprise meant that no new money was coming in. Suddenly, Castro turned on US-owned farmlands and businesses as a way to keep the money flowing into the government coffers. That was already enough to annoy the Americans, but it was about to get a lot worse. When money started getting tight, Castro turned to the Soviet Union for cash. In exchange for crude oil, fertilizers, industrial goods, and a $100 million loan, Castro agreed to provide the Soviets with sugar, fruit, and animal hides, all the things the US had been importing from Cuba for decades. This infuriated and frightened the American government even more. Their neighbor was getting a little too close to the enemy that wanted to destroy them. What would happen if Cuba became a communist country? It was so close to America, the Soviets could set up military bases, missiles, nuclear weapons right at America's doorstep. Something had to be done. As part of his deal with the Soviets, Castro ordered oil refineries to process Soviet crude oil. Cuba's oil refineries were controlled by American companies like Shell and Esso, so obviously they refused. In retaliation, Castro nationalized the refineries, which is a rosy way of saying he stole them from the American oil giant at gunpoint and put them under the control of the Cuban government. If there's anything history has taught us about getting in the way of America's love for oil, it's that it's a great way of getting to the top of America's list of countries to liberate. The US started by canceling their imports of sugar from Cuba, one of the country's biggest exports. Castro proceeded to remind America that too could play that game and nationalize the sugar mills. Needless to say, things were not going well between the two countries. And it didn't get any better when a ship from Belgium, carrying weapons to Cuba, exploded in the Havana Harbor. Castro accused the Americans, who said they had nothing to do with it. But by then, the fight was on. 
the US tried to invade Cuba and kick Castro out in 1961, the infamous Bay of Pigs invasion, which failed horribly. In retaliation, Castro got even more involved in helping the Soviets, openly declared his government to be socialist, and even let the Soviets store their nukes on the island. And that was the final straw. Castro had to go, and America didn't care what they had to do to get rid of him. Right at the start of Castro's rule, the CIA and US government had tried quietly getting rid of him. There were exploding cigars, poison wetsuits, hypodermic pen needles, and at least five other well-documented assassination attempts over the years. At one point, the CIA even got one of Castro's mistresses, Marita Lorenz, to kill him, but her nerves failed and she confessed. There was even a special CIA operation, codenamed Executive Action, whose sole purpose was to find ways to get rid of Castro. They tried everything from sabotage to straightforward murder, but with every attempt, Castro just seemed to be a little luckier than they were. Even after CIA Director Richard Helms said all assassination attempts on foreign leaders needs to stop in 1972, it seemed like Castro was the exception. The attempts to kill Castro continued right up to the year 2000, way after the Cold War had ended, when the CIA planted 90 kilos of explosives under a stage in Panama where Castro would give a speech. Unfortunately for them, his security team found the bomb when he arrived, and the die-hard dictator survived again. It had taken over 600 tries, millions of dollars, and countless CIA agents to try to kill the leader of Cuba. But after hundreds of failed assassinations, Fidel Castro finally died on November 25, 2016 from natural causes. The man survived 40 years of the CIA trying to kill him to die of old age at 90 years old. The CIA's assassination attempts on Castro were insane. But it looks like child play compared to the most dark, disturbing period in CIA history. MK Ultra, the CIA's quest for mind control. To give you a sense of how deranged these experiments were, one of them involved victims being moved into an isolation ward where they would only be given enough food, water, and oxygen to survive. Then they would be fed massive amounts of LSD, and then they would have helmets strapped onto them with headphones blasting messages like my mother hates me into their ear hundreds of thousands of times. Unfortunately, this stuff is a little too dark for YouTube's liking and would definitely get demonetized. That's why I just published a feature-length documentary on MKUltra, available only to members of this channel. It's really good, I'm really proud of it. And if you want to watch it right now, all you have to do is click the join button below or use the link in the description if you don't see the join button. From there, you'll get instant access to this documentary and our previous one on Monsanto, the company that owns the world's food supply, along with every other upcoming private documentary I release every single month with the next one being a very juicy one on everyone's favorite guy that owned a private island, Efri Jepstein. The best part is you get all this knowledge on how the world really works that they'll never teach you in business school for just $5 a month. And if you join and don't think it's worth it, email me and I will personally refund you the money. Click that join button below to watch now.